Hello, Northeast Christian Church, and welcome to our online services. Thank you for joining us today. If you miss any part of today's service and you want to catch it again, you can do so by checking us out on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Spotify. We also encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay up to date on everything we have going on here at the church. God bless and enjoy the rest of the service. We are so delighted to be with you today. I'm especially delighted to be back after having a little baby. And it is such a joy to worship. I mean, I've been back in church worshiping in the congregation with you guys, but it's really a delight to get to be playing with the worship team. This is so, such a joy and such a pleasure. And thank you guys for coming early and on time, those who came for prayer to prepare the space to honor and worship the Lord. And for you who are here for the first song to the last, I know that um, the Lord is pleased with your faithfulness and his presence is here with us and I just pray that this time of worship would be sweet, would be joyful, and that the Lord would be glorified in our praise. So with that, you're already on your feet, I love it, so let's worship the Lord. Darkness has to bow, confusion has its final hour. When you speak, mountains rise and fall, it tears down every wall around me. When you speak, breathe upon the dust, come alive and up. When you speak, you silence every fear. We feel your spirit here around us. Let there be light. Let there be
Let's just make that our prayer this morning. Come like a fire. Come bring your freedom. Come Holy Spirit, come like a flood. Invade our hearts, Lord. Invade our thoughts, Lord. Come like a flood. Like 
shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord
Dear Lord, you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy of the praise that we can give. You alone, not the kings, not the presidents, not the prime ministers or any other potentates. Lord, we thank you. We are grateful that we are able to come to your presence to worship you, joining our voices with those of the angel giving you praise. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit who is at work within us. Thank you for your presence in, your, in the person of the Spirit of God. Lord, we are grateful for the love of God that has been made manifest among us through your church, through your people. 
Lord, we pray as we continue to worship that each and everyone here present will be blessed. Those who are worshiping online will be blessed. Lord, we pray that the hungry soul may be fed today, the weary heart strengthened, the broken restored, the confused, Lord Jesus, be refocused. Let the lost identity be recentered on Christ. Let the lost baby be found, and may the reprobate mind be redeemed. Lord, we don't deserve anything, Lord Jesus, except condemnation. But here we are, accepted in Christ Jesus, the beloved. We have nothing to prove to anyone, Lord Jesus, nothing to earn from you. And yet you call us to live worthy of the gospel. Help us today be infused with new vigor, with new power to live the life to which you call us. We love your presence, your Lord, and we ask you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, NECC. My name is Wilson Cesar, for those who do not know me. It is a pleasure and a blessing to have each and every one here today worshiping with us, including those who are worshiping via internet. So it is my pleasure to welcome each and every one here today. And in the Psalms, it says, David says, uh, I was glad when they told me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So in that same vein, I'd like to say, uh, welcome. Welcome to the worship service we have here. Welcome to each and every one. And we'd like to say at NECC, we believe in a process called Take Three. So if you are a first-time guest, we encourage you to visit us not once, not twice, but three times. Because the first time you come, you are a guest. The second time, you're still a guest. But on the third time, we consider you family. So please, as you worship, so give us another two tries, if that's your first time, and that we may get to know you and you may get to know us. One thing my wife and I and our children benefited from when we came here about two years ago, we find people who took the time to hang out with us, to take us out to lunch, to eat Dominican food, Indian food, you name it. So needless to say, in our community, you can expect to have a shoulder to cry on, someone to listen to you, if you have a burden. And so that's what we find here. And we, we hope that the Lord will bless you even more than he has blessed us here in this community. With that said, I give you Pastor Dylan for the morning announcement. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you very much. I am going to dismiss youth at this time so you guys can head back and meet with Pastor Kevin. And I'm sure he's got a great lesson for you today. So youth, you can head on out. Now, also just another preliminary announcement before we get to the rest of our announcements. A reminder to those of you who are serving today, Jacob's Well is happening after service, and you can meet uh, Pastor Bertrand in the back. He'd be glad uh, to give you instructions on that. And if you'd like to learn more about serving in Jacob's Well, of how you can uh, serve our community here locally, please talk to me after church at the welcome desk. I'd love to get you some more info on that. Well, just a couple of things coming up. We have uh, the annual business meeting. Uh, that's been postponed, that has been scheduled for April, uh, that's a mistake, sorry, I shouldn't have put April 9th, it's April 19th, excuse me, April 19th, it's a Wednesday, and that's online only from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., keeping an eye on your inbox for an invite to that, and we'll meet on April 19th, Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.00. Uh, you might have gotten handed one of these little Easter cards on the way in, a uh, little invite card. You can thank me for that spectacular design. Yes, look at that. I did so good. Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. Pat myself on the back there. Thank you, Canva. Anyway, uh, I hope that you take that and you seriously pray and consider, who can I invite to church with this little card? I think... I've read some stats recently that say 80% of those who are invited to church say they would, they'd come if somebody would invite them. Excuse me, people who don't go to church say they'd come if somebody would invite them, especially around the holiday season. So this is a great time to invite your friends and family and say, hey, come to church, check it out. Uh, and we're going to be having two services, 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. on Easter Sunday. We'll also have a beautiful petting zoo upstairs, so uh, any families that come along can pet a bunch of animals that I want nothing to do with. No, I'm just kidding. I'll be up there to, to supervise and help as need be. 
Uh, speaking of dirty things, we have a church cleanup day coming up on, uh, on Saturday. Uh, this Saturday, April 1st, we're going to be having a cleanup day. This is just a time to spruce up the church, spring cleaning, prepare for Easter, all of those sorts of things. Uh, that'll be from Saturday 9, to 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., 9 to noon. Uh, we're just going to be having a cleanup day service. You can sign up at the welcome desk right after service, and I appreciate you guys putting in the time for that as well. And before I jump off stage and turn it over to Pastor Paul, I just want to thank you for your continued giving. Everything that we do here, from helping our local community to sending missionaries all around the world, happens because you give. And we're so grateful for that, that you've continued to be faithful in that. And so, as we look to the Lord and look to him in worship in this way, would you join me in prayer? Lord, thank you for giving your son to us. And thank you for creating giving people out of us. I pray that we'd be the kind of people who glorify you in that way all of our lives. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. going old school here. Mic drop. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So great to be back with you. Uh, we had such an amazing uh, banquet yesterday. It was, we, we really, really believe in, in appreciating you because the church is not the pastors. The church is all of us working together. And so many of you in so many different ways uh, just make this place great. And so what we, we, what we did was is we had uh, a violin and viola player up here so that during, it was like dining to classical music. It was so amazing. And uh, we had food and then we gave away some, uh, instead of the Dundies, for any of you familiar with the office, we gave away the Northeasties. And uh, a couple of you couldn't make it, but Sean, I want you to know we have the Chuck Norris Kilt, kicking Delta Force Award for you. And uh, we, we gave out some fun ones, but then what we did is, is we started a new tradition where uh, once a m every quarter, we give the servant award to a specific ministry team. And this year, I'm proud to say, went to security. And let me tell you why. Any of you who uh, know... Um, uh, Cliff, who used to do security that was here some years back, he was a sixth degree black belt. Uh, he's the most lethal guy I ever knew, and he was just quiet. So, like, you would be gone before you even knew it. And so, he was very big on security. The police department complimented us. They said we're one of the only ones that contacted them and said we want to, this to be a safe place. And we regularly have the police department come through and do everything from like what you had learned recently, the Narcan training, to them assessing, hey, you need to change this, you need to fix that, you need to do that. And so we take all of those measures that they say and we put them in place. So that, I want you to know something, this is a safe church. And um, this is not the church for someone to show up and to do wrong in because there are so many heroes here. And so I just wanna say thank you personally to um, all of you who are in security, and we're gonna display this in the foyer for the next three months, and here's what's gonna happen. In the three months that pass that they hold this, they're gonna be keeping their eye on all the other teams, and in three months, they will be presenting it to the next team that they feel has earned this award, and so they get to hold the glory, and we'll throw a special party for them at like, uh, you know, top of the hub at Prudential or something like that, and we'll just, we'll just celebrate really, really well, but it was a great, great time. Um, so, amen. We, I was going to speak to you this week on God being just, and I just felt like it needed more serious preparation, because it's very easy to say, 
God is just, and in order to go into that topic, I also have to go into, well, if God's just, why do bad things happen? That's, I, that's easy. It's when if God is just, why did he order the destruction of an entire city? If God is just, and so I didn't want to give it a half-baked presentation. So I started praying and saying, Lord, you know, what could I talk about? What could I do here that would not only be a good thing for us to learn about, but we could also have some fun in the process. So church is going to be uh, church today, but we're going to kind of do it backwards. We're going to work our way back into the word of God, and we're going to center ourselves in a truth today that is called identity. Where does your identity come from? How is it, sh how is it shaped? What should it be? It's a very... Uh, convoluted topic and not just right now when i say this in the presence whether you're watching online today or in the future you're here when i say identity it's easy for you to instantly go towards the prohibitions of like um, people changing their gender people changing their sexual orientation and um, sure that's one part of it but uh, you could be a normal person your whole life and never be who god has created you to be and, and not fully experience the gifts that God's given you, the purpose that he's given you. I believe there is no snowflake the same. There's no fingerprint alike. There's no one who is like you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what the Lord said. And so in order to really help make this point, I need three victims. And so um, actually four victims. So I'm going to just pick them out, right? So uh, I thought I saw Mark Belisario here. Where are you, Mark? Yeah, come on up. Come on up here. There's one. Give it up for him. All right. Kimberly Greenwood, I'm going to pull you up, you victim. Yeah, you've been hiding there, but I got your number. All right, we'll, we'll find, another, we'll find uh, another victim here in a second. I can't do it. I love Lee. I can't do that. You're amazing. Um, but uh, I'm, all right, uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually ask if Patty could come up. We'll take, we'll take you up here. Come on up. Yeah. All right. You scared? <laughs> you should be. All right. So, and then why don't we get, I know, I know she's on the door and she's helping, but those ushers got it. Why don't we get the baby mama of the year, Sienna? Come on up here, if you would. All right. Awesome, ladies. Uh, do you have any idea why you're up here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to give the, the ladies here pieces of paper. And Mark, you get to be our uh, GQ model. And that's why I called you here. So what we're going to do is this. I'm going to give you each a pencil. And uh, I want you to know they have erasers on them. But we do have one here for big mistakes, if they make any errors, right? We actually, I think, have cued some classical music just in the spirit of yesterday. And so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to actually have um, our GQ model here, Mark. Uh, Rebecca, very lucky woman she is, married to this handsome man. We're going to have you sit right there. And we would love for you to take the thinking posture, the thinker, right? Okay, and what we do is, is as the music plays, wherever you feel comfortable, whether you do that, I want you within three minutes to do a portrait of Mark. Okay, do you think they can do it? All right, ready or not. Are we cued? Take it away. And let me tell you something. In this church, no. All right. Good. You're going to have to go, like, really faster, you know? Are you confident in what you're doing right now? No, not at all. No? Listen, second place is first loser. Who's going to win? I am. <laughs> All right, we got some competition now on the stage. This is called profound thought. How many of you ever do this in the morning before you had your coffee and drools coming out of the side of your mouth? Pretty good. I'm going to actually make it two minutes. You got to do it in two minutes. 
Pressure's on. Yeah, we'll count it down. We'll do 10, 9, 8, 7. I'm watching the numbers in the back. We've got about uh, 60 seconds left. Uh, today's prize will be um, a trip to Jamaica. All expenses paid. Nice. Good. Oh, don't look at me. Look at him. There's I'm so sorry I did this to you. <laughs> Rebecca, if you didn't get a picture of it, you're going to miss this window. You did? Yeah? <laughs> She's like, yeah. I want the video from church, too. What does this have to do with Jesus? Absolutely nothing, but it's very fun. I'm just kidding. It's actually everything that has to do with Jesus. We're going to talk about him. All right. I'm not feeling like uh, I want to wait around any longer. Let's count it down. Ten. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. We're going to release you so that you don't have to be up here a second more than you need to. Okay. We're going to do a clap -o meter on the pictures. So we're going we're gonna to bring them by here. You, you need to, art, artists, va the value increases if the artist signs the picture. You did. That looks like kid scribble. That's not your signal. No, I'm just kidding. You got to sign yours. Go ahead, sign it. All right, here we go. There we are. All right, no claps yet. You're going to get even with me, aren't you? So <laughs> no claps. So, so far we have Kimberly's right here. Let's give it some, let's give it some, ooh. Yeah, okay. We have Sienna's. Let's go, ah. Okay, and then we have Patty's right here. <laughs> All right. So, what do we think by clapometers? Remember, my life's on the line. Um, Kimberly's clapometer. It's pretty good. They're a charitable group. Good things take time. <laughs> Sienna's <laughs> captured the chair. And then Patty. <laughs> wow, all right. Well, you know what? The crowd's always right. Not biblically, but the crowd's always right. We're going to actually give the award to Patty. Give it up. Thank you, ladies. Your release. Take your pictures with you. Uh, there's no voucher. That was a lie. <laughs> I know I can't lie in church, but I did. All right, there's no trip to Jamaica, but... Now, I want to show you a video clip. I got permission from one of the moms. I should have uh, asked everyone, but it's a, ki it's a kid moment, and I asked these kids a couple of questions. Let, let me ask you this. How many of you want to become an artist? Mm -hmm. How many of you want to sing in public? Okay. Well, let's, let's play this video clip real quick with volume cranked. Take a look here on the screen of what our kids think here at Northeast look Christian here. Church. How many of you want to be an artist? Real quick, again. All right. How many of you want to be a professional sports player? All right. How many of you can sing? You can sing. Can you sing? You can. That's it. And I just think that's awesome. All right. Uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to help. You don't know yet? All right. Well, hey, uh, how many of you it's good would right draw there. a picture of somebody else if they asked you to? They said, could you draw a picture of me? Uh, yeah. Awesome. So think about this for a second, right? I just picked out victims from the crowd, volunteers, we'll call them, and asked them, you know, if they'd do it, and they were kind of like, uh, okay. Uh, and and here's, here's the thing, too. If I ask three kids, who wants to draw a picture? Every hand in the room will go up. If I were to do this, let's do it a different way. I'm going to pick three victims to sing up here on the platform. How many of you would say, Pastor Paul, I will be gone for the rest of my life from this place if you do this to me, right? You're like, this is my first time, and I, it will be my last time because I will not get up there and do that. Ask a room full of kids. Do you want to sing? All of their hands will go up like, yeah, me. And what is it that happens to us? that starts as a child, is willing to draw a picture, is open to be willing to try and fail and explore the possibilities, what inhibits us 
what holds us back? There's, I'm going to have a skip over to uh, one of the slides. Forgive me, my phone is in between Apple IDs. And I'm going to go to the guy holding the question mark on his face. If you could jump to that particular slide. And we'll go from here forward. This morning, I, I, I just doubled back on my prep. And I, I asked Google, what's the difference between to identity and identify? And your identity is how you define yourself, while your identification is how others define you. Now, what's interesting is, is that that's not what the dictionary says. It's not originally what the word identity and identify means. In the dictionary, identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. It is not defined by the vantage point of what the thing thinks, wants, or feels, but in actuality, what it is defined as. And to identify with something, it, it, you establish or you indicate who or what someone or something is. It literally means you're on the outside and you're saying, okay, this is a car because it has wheels, because it has doors, because it runs an engine. And what's interesting is, is in the short period of the last decade, an entire generation, an entire people group has arisen that has taken the new concept of what identity is by just complete artistic license. Or maybe how they feel that day. Or maybe how they're confused that week. Maybe how depressed they feel that month. Maybe how off they feel that year. There's a lot of confusion on identity. What's interesting is that the atheist and scientist Richard Dawkins, who is not a fan of, of us, but interestingly enough, he just said this recently, and I'm speaking much broader than sexuality and sexual identity here, but he recently said there are two sexes and that's all there is to it scientifically. So here's somebody outside of the faith-based community that's saying that, that's speaking to the issue of sexuality, but it's so much more than sexuality. Uh, I remember when American Idol hit the scene and everybody wanted to be a rock star. And uh, in fact, a, a precious young lady in our life, um, Angela Miller, ended up being the third contestant in that competition. She came in number three. She didn't hit number one, but she, she almost did. And she started a career. She's out in LA. She's going around singing, doing her thing. And, and, uh, but what was amazing was is that all of a sudden, you could, you could just, uh, there were some, you know, if you've ever, how many of you have ever watched the tryouts for American Idol and you're like, oh my goodness, don't let that person on the stage, right? Everybody has a face that a mother can love and everybody likes to sing, but not everybody is called to sing, right? Uh, and, it's, and it's okay, but the, the two greatest questions in life are simply this, whether we feel we want to be something or, um, you know, we have a realistic dream or a, an idealistic con fantasy or whether we are clear about who we are or we're confused about it. Two greatest questions are simply this, who am I? And why am I here? In other words, what is my identity? Who am I? And what's my purpose in life? See, I am of the opinion that if God, who I believe, I'm coming from a vantage point. So you have to understand this. If you're here today and you're agnostic or you're an atheist or you're watching online and, you know, you're just kind of seeing what things churches are saying or whatever, I, I will be honest with you. I'm coming from the disposition that I believe that God exists, that he's real. And I believe that the Bible is is given to us as God's word. And I believe the truth that's in there, it's profound. Even if you were simply a secular person and you just put in a, an atheist and you put into practice the wisdom in Proverbs, man, your life would be so great. Your marriage would be wonderful. It gives great, great advice for simple things. A soft answer turns away wrath. Somebody comes up to you and goes, hey, I, I should punch your face in. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you should be. Well, I am. Yeah, a soft answer turns away wrath. There's great wisdom in there, but however you feel about it, 
the great, the, the, the Bible would say this, God would say this of himself and of you and I, that before, he knew you before he knit you in, his, in your mother's womb. In fact, he would take it a step further. He'd say, not only did I know you before I knit you in your mother's womb, but all of your days were written in my book before one of them came to be. God would say, I love you with an everlasting love. Marriage doesn't even give you that. We have good years, we have rough years. We have good seasons, we have challenging seasons. And God says, my love for you is continual. My care for you is continual. And I think in the world that we live in, whether you're a Christian or not, I think one of the things that everybody is desperately trying to understand is, is who am I? What's my purpose? What's, what am I here for? And there's lots of different ways of going about this, but take a, I want to take you back to middle school, that place where everybody gets your friends to hate their friends. Remember that phase of life? Take a look at this, this picture here, this group of gals. And... Um, Here's what I'd like you to do. Taking a look at, at this crew that's right here. If they wear their thoughts on their sleeve, who, what in the world, if you were to put words in their mouth, what would you, what would you say? I think it's pretty clear that uh, the girl turned sideways in the pink is saying, I know who I am, I know what I'm about, and she has this, raging confidence about her. I think the girl next to her with the black dress with the white band is like, I want to be her. Um, the one next to the other one might be close in friendship to her. She feels pretty secure in what she does. And the one on the end there is just kind of like, hey guys, just happy to be there. But you remember that stage of life where you were taking your cues from everybody else? Remember that phase? It wasn't as long ago as you think where, you know, you saw somebody you admired or, and, and now you take that a step further and you, you look at what television, streaming, the internet, social media, in any form that's out there, and it has been a nonstop, if you thought it was a nonstop campaign back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, in the 2000s and in the 2010s and the 2020s, this is about to take a life of its own and with uh, AI involved in the process, we may not be able to reel this back. We've got messages going out to the young people that went upstairs and to those of us that are here, they're reaching back into the things that we looked up to in our younger years and they're replaying them to us saying, this will make you happy. This will make you content. This will make you successful. And they're just replaying the real because they want to get you to buy what they want to sell you. And when I look at these young ladies, and I could put a group of guys up there and you could get the same conclusions, I think about Colossians 1.15 where it says that Jesus, he is the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And in Colossians 3.30 which says this, if God, Jesus is the, in, the invisible God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the firstborn of all creation, then the Colossians 3.30 says this, and he has put on the new self, he's talking to us now, put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. In other words, God's inviting us not to put on the cloth of this kingdom, of this world, but to put on the character and the convictions of Christ. And when we do that, and we take our leads from that, great things begin to happen. Confusion lifts, clarity becomes clear. Now, let me just say this, because I know in the back of everybody's mind, it's easy to think when I say identity, I'm speaking to LGBTQ community, transgender, and, but this is so much broader than that. This is where's your self-confidence come from and where does, there are people in my life 
who are a part of the LGBTQ community who I love. For someone to say to me as a follower of Christ, because I'm a Christian, I hate them, that's, that's not true. But I can, we live in a day where, with not just this issue, but the definitions of success and all these different things, we've made it that if somebody does not agree with you, that we have the right to hostily attack that view rather than respect and tolerantly leave that person uh, you believe that? I'm s I disagree with that. Today, you can't even say, I disagree with that. That's, you know, hate speech has gone from this thing where uh, we, we saw for, for centuries in this country of, of race or um, socioeconomic issues where people would, would talk down to people with slurs. That's hate speech. But now hate speech has become this thing that says that if you don't agree with me, and fully support and believe what I believe, you hate me. That makes no sense. It doesn't. So where do we get our cues from? Take a look at this video clip, and then we're gonna dive deeper into the word, but just bear with me as we take this kind of backwards approach into scripture here. I want you to see this clip, very, very compelling. Dove, uh, which is the, you get Dove soap from them, they put together a video clip as, a, they actually created a campaign that was going against the flow of what culture had done trying to sell products. They, they basically said, if you wanna be beautiful, you look like that, to little girls. If you wanna be, you know, Barbie is the ultimate of what beauty is. And why is it everybody's dyeing their hair blonde? D don't take that personally if you're here and you're just, cause I wanna be a blonde. Blondes have more fun, that's good. I believe I'm Irish and redheads have more fun, but that's you. But uh, I, the, the whole idea of, of identity was being pitched and shaped in young girls to where they were eating disorders like anorexia, bulimacy, um, which actually is probably in this room right now. Um, struggling with how I look, I ate too much, I hate how I feel, and then you purge that, or I don't like my parents, I've got too much weight, I'm gonna stop eating, and um, that's literally what was happening in our culture. So they took a step and they said, let's put together a clip that tries to undo some of the damage that's been done. Take a look at this real quick, and then let me share one more picture and then some scriptures with you. absolutely crazy and believe it or not you know what they did is is they took us behind the scene of the of the of the industry to show you what's really going on in fact the lady who they portrayed to sell that product her neck was different her eyes were different that person doesn't even exist and when I read in Genesis 127 that it says that God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, listen to how the Bible, when it often uses him, it's inclusive language, male and female, he created them. I understand that my image doesn't come outward, nor does it come inward. It comes upward. Do you hear that? Your identity does not come outward, nor does it come inward, it comes upward. 
You're created in the image of God. The fancy Latin word for that is imago Dei. Everyone say whoop de doo Yeah. If you are addicted to heroin right now, I just want you to know the fact that you know Latin is going to change your life. It's just a fancy way of saying, listen, what changes your life is not fancy stuff. What changes your life is when you understand that you are not defective. You are designed. You're not garbage. You're gorgeous. You have been created in the image of God and in his likeness, and you're his son, and you're his daughter, whether you know him well or you don't know him at all. You have been born with a purpose. I feel like I'm on a submarine. I don't know what that is, but do you hear it? It's good? Just keep going. Just roll with it. All right. True identity is found when we look to the one whose image we were created in. We're called to be his sons and daughters. Being in the presence, listen, being, you, you ever hear the saying, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are, right? Uh, a lot can be revealed about your family. Now, some of us have lost mothers and fathers and we can't live the life of a mother or father to be the example we would hope them to be. But really idealistically in the world and the way that God does things, he, he would love us as adults, as parents, to reflect the image of God to others, to our children. How do, the, the number one, uh, in fact, right up the road, Simeon's Church, it says, the, the greatest lesson you'll teach is the life you lead. And being created in the image of God means that the answer comes upward. And when I look at you know, for, for those of you that are ladies here that, that, you know, I would ask you, you know, how you look. If you go back one slide real quick, um, I, want you to, I want you to take a look at this. There are two pictures here, and they're of the same person. They're the same woman. And just like we had our artists up here sketching what they were sketching, uh, they had a professional police criminal artist sketcher come in and they said to them, they said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a picture of you first. And then I want you to describe who you are because this is their profession. They let somebody tell them what that person looks like. The one on the, the left is the, is the one that they described. The one on the right is the one that the artist drew, which tells me, that we all come from a disposition where when we begin, we're already looking down at ourselves right from the gate. That we already struggle with the idea of our value, our virtue, maybe even our simply, our, if, if this is what's going on with our physical appearance, what's going on inside of our heart with our value experience? What's going on inside of our head with our character experience? 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. This is so wise. This is great. Don't think for a second, ladies, that you're the only ones that struggle with image as it comes to beauty and, and appearance. There are a lot of guys out there saying, I feel ugly. I don't know if, uh, if anyone would, would really care. But Peter says this. Hey, listen, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles, the wearing of gold, jewelry, fine clothes, Rather, it should be of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. I would say that our inner character and beauty is far more important than our outer character and beauty. So you're not defective. You're designed, you're not ugly, you're under his love, you're not an outcast, you're cast out to bear the image of the living God because identity doesn't come from outside nor does it come from inside. But the reason some of you have been struggling, whether you're watching online or you're here in this place, is, is that your identity comes upward from God. That that's the example. This is why, why people say, well, why do I have to read the Bible? You know, I'm a, I'm a worshiper, I'm a prayer, you know. Because the, 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 the mind of God is, is included in those pages to say, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. That's a very important thing to hear when all life is falling apart on you. When you feel unloved, God says, before, uh, that he says, I so love the world 
that I gave my son. You're here, and maybe you're watching, or you're in church today, and you're trying to figure out who Jesus is, and you, you just think he hates everybody that's not in his team. That's not true at all. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his son. God doesn't hate the world. He loves the world. He's trying to save the world. He's trying to save us from our own self-destructive, self-warped perspectives because we have dedicated ourselves looking outward and inward and not upward toward that identity. I sat with my father recently. He's in rehab now. He went from the hospital to rehab. He should be in there for about four weeks. My brother and I are tossing my mom back and forth, and you'll get to meet her. She'll be here for Easter. She is the sweetest lady on the planet. And, um, but my dad was just so angry, and he hit his fist because he's got COPD, and his body's failing him. And I, I said, Dad, if you're looking outward to try and get a 20-year-old body again or a lung tr transplant, you're going to be disappointed. If you look inward and say, why can't I get myself healthy? You're going to be frustrated. But if you stop looking outward and inward and you look your identity upward to God and realize the hope of Jesus Christ is not just that he forgives your sin, but that we will be resurrected, that we will live forever for all eternity, that your hope needs to be, as, as Pastor Dylan says from Tim Keller there, you need to reallocate your hope upward. And I'm saying, Dad, you know what? You're not going to get it in this life, but Jesus is coming back. You are going to run again. You are going to breathe again. You are going to be again. Because you serve a God who is eternal. He's eternal. Listen, you know what the central crux of the faith of Christianity is? Everybody would say the cross, the cross. No, it's not. The cross is one of those pillars. It's the resurrection because there were thousands of people dying on the cross. There were probably brothers who died on behalf of their, their little brother and took the blame for people and died on a cross. Jesus took the blame of the entire world, but what makes Christ different from any other guru, religion, or leader in the world is he is the only one to say that I was not only the one to give away, to take away your sin, I was also the one that beat death and rose from the dead. And that is what Easter is about. And that's where our identity is. We serve a risen, eternal, resurrecting God. I want to introduce you to a fine-suited gentleman here real quick. Let me introduce you to Sir Wagner Cambridge. He's of royal descent and London's Wall Street. He's the number one hedge fund manager in uh, the London Stock Exchange. He's outdone Warren Buffett by $733,000 in net worth. All privilege and opportunity was handed to him from childhood because he comes from the descent of dukes and duchess of England. He owns three jets, he never waits in a line, and he prefers his meals and desserts flown into him from Europe, occasionally the United States, and on rare occasions from Latin America and Asia. How many of you would say, give me a slice of that pie, baby? Right? Everything I just told you is a lie. Take a look at this.
Sir Wagner Cambridge. Not everything is the way that it appears, is it? And we have this idea when we look outward and when we look inward, and there's always a deficit in all of those directions. It's not until we look upward that we understand that we were made in the image of God. I was saying this yesterday at the, the volunteer banquet. David wrote this about God. Your tenderness and your gentleness has made me great. You stoop down to make me great. And what makes Jesus say to you and I, a servant shall be the greatest among you, shall be servant to all, is this, is, is that when it's not until we get down on the level with people and we realize that's Jesus. That's not only Jesus, that's you and I. If you have somebody that you look down on, there'll always be a task you look down on, there'll always be a person you'll look down on. But what does God do? God comes down below our level. He comes into our world. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And he says, I'm going to suffer the way you suffered. I'm going to deal with the things that you dealt with. Jesus wasn't born speaking every language in the world and doing trigonometry. He subjected himself to the human experience so that he could look at you and I in the face for all eternity and say, I understand. In fact, the thing that he chooses... The only scars in heaven to remain will be the ones that he has from the cross. Which means that every time you see him, that crown that you have for any good you did will be coming off and saying, it's because of you. It's because of you. Jesus is the ultimate role model. God is the source of identity. And it is no wonder that the world is so confused when he says to find your life, you have to lose it. To live, you first must die. To be the greatest, you have to be the servant of all. Because we're looking to have people serve us. And Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The famous childhood story of the ugly duckling is really a story of identity. Uh, a swan finds himself born his egg rolls into a nest or a mud. I don't, I don't know how it quite gets there, but he ends up being born among all these, ch these baby chicks and they, they all make fun of him and they laugh at him. And then as time goes by, his nature of who he was ev evolves into a beautiful, elegant swan. And he doesn't recognize it until he sees one of his own. On the other hand, there's a famous story called the hawk that thought he was a chicken. And every time that hawk went out, he'd go out with the chickens and pluck the seed off of the ground and walk around, and he acted like a chicken. He tried to sound like a chicken. He was embarrassed because he wasn't a chicken, but he was just like, this is who I am. This is my nature. And he was told, well, we don't fly. There's a fence there, and that keeps us in here, and we're just happy because our food is taken care of, our life is taken care of. And he allowed the limitations of what was around him, outside of him, and what was inside of him to, to dictate his potential. Until one day he looked up and he saw himself, a group of, of, of birds flying that were hawks. And he has a choice at that moment. I think it's the same thing with us. We have a choice at that moment where we can continue to see outward at the world around us, we can continue to look inward at the insecurity inside of us, or we can turn our eyes upward and realize that we were made and created for so much more. Not everything is the way that it appears. There is no fingerprint the same. There is no snowflake alike. There is no you like you. God is not looking for someone else. He's looking for you, faults and all moles and all, insecurities and all, because he is glorified through our life when we allow our vision not to come outward or inward, but to come from us from upward and realize that we are capable of so much more. He said that he made man in his own image, in the likeness 
He said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. There's a difference between dominion and domination. Don't misinterpret what I'm trying to say. Dominion is not imposing by force or insecurity or power trips on people to have the upper edge. That is not, that is, that is, that is domination. It is sinful. It is wrong. But dominion is when you walk into a situation that is bigger than you, and instead of looking outward and looking inward at your resource, you look upward at your God, and you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am made in the image of God. He has chum- he's chosen me a humble reflection of his image, and I can bring about God's purpose and God's kingdom through my life because he has given me a set of gifts and he has put me where he has put me and he has given me what he has given me and even the things that might seem like a disadvantage God can use for his glory in your life he knows how to use you what you're capable of so much more back in 1954 Roger Bannister for Oxford University broke a record that had never been broken in recorded history, at least. It was the four-minute mile. Up until that point, nobody broke the four-minute mile. And then all of a sudden, after he did that, another person broke it. Another person broke it. And to date, right now, as of 20, or actually as of 2021, 1,664 athletes broke the barrier. Why do I say that? I say that to say this, that God has given you gifts. God has given you purpose. God has given you significance. And it doesn't mean that you have to be something you're not. He has made you the way you are. But you need to stop looking outward at the world around you. You need to stop looking at the deficits and the insecurities inside of you. And you need to learn through reading God's word, through talking to him, through being in God's community, to learn to look upward and to know I can do more than I think I can. There's nothing more satisfying. Listen, There is nothing more satisfying than doing God's will with in partnership with God's presence with God's people that makes an eternal difference there's nothing if you've never done that I can't I can't create I can't take my experience and put that inside of you but I know this if you if you if you look up and stop looking out and in and you begin to look Upward at his word, upward at his presence. Jesus said, follow me for a reason, because he's worth following. He's worth following. John 1.14 says this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It literally means that God made a tent. Or here's actually in the 21st century how we would say it. Jesus bought the house next door to us, got a job, lived a life, made friends. He did life with us. See, I'm so tired of leaders that use people as pawns. And they, their skill set is strategy to accomplish a goal. Not one of you is a pawn of Jesus Christ. He's not using you in an abusive way to accomplish his purposes. You're not disposable to him. You're not expendable to him. You're precious to him. You are the king and the queen of his court. And he did it by taking a towel and washing his disciples' feet. He did it by buying the house next door. He did it by allowing him to become flesh and dwell among us. And you might ask yourself, what does God look like? In fact, in India, there are two famous ministries in the, in the 20th century. One particular missionary, Mark Buntain, who had a huge orphanage in India. And another one, his na- uh, her name was Mother Teresa. And you're probably possibly familiar with both of them. But Mark Buntain said, my greatest teacher was Mother Teresa. One day they went out through Calcutta, and all she would do through the day is find people. She'd do what we say in this church. She would find a need and meet it. And as she was walking through the streets, there was a guy decomposing from leprosy, crippled, 
curled up in a doorway. People were walking by, walking over him. And she brought Mark, and they bandaged up some wounds. They gave him some food. They gave him something to drink. They offered him some help. And at the end of the day, Mark was like, wow, that was something. This was his, his earlier years when he was easing into ministry, and Mother Teresa had already been there for a long time. And she said, Mark, did you see him? And he's like, see who? Jesus, did you see him today, Mark? And, she, and he was like, uh, what do you mean? Mark, you didn't see him? He was in that doorway. He was there with leprosy. And when we do this to the least of these, we do, it's as if we've done it to him. You see, you don't have to become a famous evangelist and own a jet, <laughs> you know. By the way, I don't own a jet. Um, you just find a need and meet it. You just find a hurt and heal it. You just find the joy of serving because just like that volunteer banquet, once you find the joy of serving, you'll never want to be served again. But that only happens when you look upward, not outward and inward. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good deeds, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Labels like defective, disability, distracted, slap them on all you want. When I was in fifth grade, they did not know what to do with me. In fact, when I was in first grade, can I make a confession here? This is my Catholic roots. When I was in first grade, I was kicked out of Catholic parochial school because I was flipping up all the nuns' dresses just to freak them out, make them angry. I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that it made them real mad, and so I would just do it. Like, it's amazing I can bend my hands because I got the ruler so much because of this. They told my parents, you need to get him out, you need to get him in public school. When I got into public school, I created, I think I created the ADHD definition, by the way. You can thank me for that, for all of you that, uh, that label was the byproduct. In fact, there was a medical research study that was done by uh, New York's Grassland Hospital and Research Center. They put an EKG up to me. They were like, what is it with this kid? Like, it was very hyper, very distracted. Um, all over the place. My, my mom, such a patient woman, she just didn't know what to do with me, so she just let me do and, and somehow survived. I was out of my mind all over the place. When I came to high school, I had so much baggage and damage in my life because of things that happened within me, because of things that happened to me, that by the time I turned 16, I dropped out of school. And I felt so bad about myself. Once I discovered alcohol and drugs, I just dove all in because at least I felt good. Listen, anyone who tells you that sin isn't pleasurable doesn't understand the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. But what happens is, is those things, God has given us our lives so that we could strive and achieve and get satisfaction out of things that that do good, not only for us, but for others. And when you bypass that process with alcohol or with drugs, you just remove that process and your brain says to yourself, I don't need to produce this anymore. I got everything covered. Just give me more of that stuff and it'll take care of it. Now, um, I, I never drink. I would be a liar to tell you that drinking is sin. The Bible says drunkenness is sin. So understand me as a pastor. Um, I don't touch it. And it's kind of crazy that in our day, I'm just taking a second here, but in our day, uh, just watching the process, first of all, the, the, the reason why marijuana is legal now is because it's a great tax revenue. But it is a terrible thing in the sense that it takes care of the momentary symptoms, but it's removing your body's natural way of having to do the work to accomplish something good for someone else and for yourself so that your body naturally feels good about itself. And it just hijacks it. I sit back and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, 
so sad. I have no, no judgment over anyone that is on that for medical reasons or recreational reasons. The law of the land at this point is there. I just think it's a really bad idea because people are not able to tap into the process that God's intended them for. Understand me and hear me. There are some of you that are here that have, your body has stopped producing certain chemicals and it is just as sure as a broken leg needs a cast. You need chemistry. I had my thyroid removed and for the rest of my life, I have to take thyroid medication because my body doesn't produce it. Otherwise, I'll slip into a coma. So if you ever see me dozing off in church, just elbow me. Just be like, wake up, dude. Did you take your medication? I can't, I can't help that. I can't, I can't change that. And there are some of us here that the people that we love have come to us and said, hey, listen, you don't feel the difference, but this makes the difference when, when you're doing that. So I'm not talking about genuine value to chemistry. We can pray that Jesus heals us, but sometimes he uses people and he uses breakthroughs in the world that we live in. But when we're just going around making ourselves feel better, because when we take that pill or we take that puff or we take that fourth, fifth glass of wine, that shot, we're not looking upward, we're looking outward and we're looking inward. And God's looking at us saying, you are capable of so much more. You are capable of so much more. He's not looking at you saying, I'm disgusted, I'm ashamed, you're my son, you're my daughter. No, it, you might be here and it's not uncommon on any Sunday for someone to be in here and you are in the middle of a raging meth addiction. You're in the middle of a raging sexual addiction. You're in the middle of uh, a cocktail of medications and stuff that, that are there and I wouldn't want to, I'm not your doctor, I'm not here to tell you that, I'm just, but I'm telling you this, is, is that you are capable of so much more. There is freedom in Jesus and there's freedom in finding your identity in Jesus Christ. There's someone who I know who I love that struggles with, with cross-dressing and God loves them. There's, there are people that I know who uh, say that they're, uh, they're, they're gay, they're lesbian, they're, and here's, listen to me, I love them, God loves them. But right now things in our culture are looking anywhere except upward, and I think uh, my encouragement to you, I can't, I can't influence the world, but my influence to you as a pastor would be this, is not to tell you what to think, you're your own person, but that you would begin to search the scriptures, and it's, it's work, but you would begin to say, what does God have to say about these things? And that you would not take your cues from culture outward, but you, listen, not even just taking your cues, what if you just began to allow another voice to speak into your life? I think you'd begin a journey that would change your life. I, I, not to, I, just to come back to this subject, one of the most beautiful I use the word beautiful for a man, but his heart was so beautiful. His name was Al Toledo. He was in Bible college with me. He, he ended up marrying Chrissy Cimbala, who's Jim Cimbala's wife. And every Friday night, I mean, he was as manly as you could be, but every Friday night he was out on the strip where there were, but this is going back into the, into the late 80s, early 90s. And he was out there telling people who were cross-dressed prostitutes and uh, drug addicts and part of the LGBTQ community and says, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. And he would fill row after row in the church with people who had spent their whole life looking outward and inward and never upward. And those people became leaders in the church. See, God doesn't hate the world. He loves the world. And I think that we need to begin to, to ask ourselves, God, what do, you, what do you have for me? Because everybody else will tell you. I'm going to ask the worship team just to come back or Mary Evelyn, whichever is easier. And um, I, I usually, this concept that I'm sharing with you, I want to close with a story that's probably familiar to, to some of you if you've been around me for 
two decades or more, you've probably heard me share this story, but it really has to do with purpose, it has to do with identity, and it has to do with labels. There was a little girl in a school, and she was uh, just like me. She, she moved around all over the place, never stopped, um, talked constantly. Uh, the teacher would start to get an idea out, and she would just finish the thought. Uh, she would, hey, hey, you ever do, do this? Like, I was one of those kids where it's like you were bouncing constantly. Gosh, put a pencil in my hand, and I would just be like this. I mean, this is me mellow. They, you know, the Lord had to remove my thyroid to chill me out. I was out of my mind. And uh, any of you that were with me uh, 10, 15 years ago, you, you know how hyper and vigilant I was. And it said, this is like chill Paul, but uh, even in my adulthood. And, it, and she would just be that kid that was just, and finally the teacher couldn't take it anymore. And she said to the principal, she said, either I go or that child goes, but I can't take it anymore. And there had been a long uh, list of what the teacher would call offenses at that point. Um, and so she called in the principal. He called in the parents. And this is going back some time, years ago. And radio was the thing at that time. And so he had a little foyer meeting area before his office. And so he brought the mom and dad in. And he said to the little girl, sit right here, sweetheart. I want you to wait here. And uh, I'm going to go talk to mom and dad. Principal's conflicted. He doesn't want to lose a child, but he definitely doesn't want to lose a teacher. And he turns on the radio, and as it plays, he's letting the parents in. And he looks before he closes the door, and the little girl's standing, spinning around, moving. And here he'd been preparing this speech he'd been dreading of like, we don't know what to do with your daughter. You should get her checked. You should consider this. And I would think it came from heaven. A thought just struck him. He smiled and closed the door. He sat the parents down. And he says, I'm so sorry. A terrible mistake has taken place. See, we were calling this meeting because we thought your daughter was defective, distracted, but she's actually designed. She's a dancer. And he wrote down on a piece of paper an address and a a phone number and a name and he tore it off and he says you need to remove your daughter immediately from our school and enroll her in this place and we'll help in any way we can to make this possible but I think that she'll understand in her journal the little girl wrote when she first walked in the school it was a dance school that combined the arts with the mind and she said it was the most beautiful place she had ever seen. She said, everybody was like me. They had to move to think. And I think, to be honest with you, education is about to radically have another shocking shakeup with AI because I can write a paper better than a Cambridge scholar in 30 seconds. What we need to do is create cohorts of exploration again. And this girl, as she went into the school and she began to collaborate with other girls and dance with them, she, she, became, she was just naturally gifted at it. And she grew up, and this is a picture of her today, or actually as this is a picture of her in the 80s. Her name is Jillian Lynn, and she is Lloyd, Won uh, Lloyd Weber Jones's number one dance choreographer. Every single play you've ever heard of or seen on Broadway, has her fingerprint on it. She's been acknowledged, she's originally from the British, uh, the UK, she's British, and she has a dance a school of performing arts there, but she has created stuff like Cats. She has her fingerprint on Les Miserables. She's got her fingerprint on, uh, I believe it's Phantom of the Opera, and all of these different things, why? because somebody was smart enough to recognize that things don't necessarily mean that people are defective. They're just designed different. Listen, there's no one like you. 
There's no snowflake the same. There's no fingerprint of light. There's no, God is not looking for you to be anything other than you. Why? Because you are created in the image of God. You have moments like a diamond. We are all like facets on the same diamond. And when it's turned at the right angle with the right light to the right person, it shines back. And someone says, oh. You might say, well, I'm not beautiful. That doesn't matter. Not all things that are beautiful are measured by outward appearances, just as sure as uh, Sir Weber Cambridge doesn't exist. In fact, I dare to say that when the story came full circle, some of you were moved, and if that guy was here, you would have run up and given him a big hug, whether he looked like he did before the haircut or after. God has made you for a purpose. Your identity in a day that we live in, it is so important that we stop looking outward and that you stop whining over things inwardly and you start realizing that the answers are upward and you will begin to find that there's a God in heaven who is willing to continually be here on earth with us originally with his presence then with his son and now with his Holy Spirit to speak to you and to guide you because he knows the thoughts he has for you they outnumber the sands in the sh on the shore. I wonder if we could respond this way. Maybe you're here. Now I'm going to be the first one to do it. I'm already standing. He said, there are moments in my life where I just don't feel adequate. This is kind of a dumb altar call, right? Stand to your feet if this is you. This is every single one of us. Why don't we just rise, unless you medically can't. And I believe we're rising in the presence of God. You are not enough. You are insufficient, but that shouldn't scare you. That should drive you upward because God is all-powerful, as we've been talking about. He is all-knowing. He is all-sufficient. He's not in heaven finding out three days later, oh my goodness, they failed me. It didn't catch him by surprise. It was actually you he caught. To keep the damage from being greater. See, God doesn't hate you. He loves you. But as your pastor, I think God would want me to say, you are capable of so much more. How many of you would say, God, just use me. Help me find a need and meet it. Help me find a hurt and heal it. Help me find the joy of serving. Because the greatest, this world is backwards. If you're looking outward, it's going to say, be served. If you're looking inward, it's going to say, I just need me time. I need to be, you know, helped. And, and I need to get myself together. And, and you never will. But if you look upward to him, he'll take your hand and he'll say, where you lack, I'll make the difference. Where you fail, I'll bring success. Because my love for you doesn't depend on your performance. It depends on your dependency in me. So Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for the truth that we were made in your image. We're not sniping the world around us because the church is filled with so many hang-ups of looking outward and looking inward that the world could honestly point out just as many flaws in the church as we could outside of it. That's not what you're about. You're about pointing us to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and that we are to be clothed in Christ, that we were created, we're your workmanship, we're created for good works in Christ Jesus, and I pray that you fill this room, you fill those watching online, you fill our lives with purpose, and that, Lord, that you would captivate us again the way that we did when we fell in love for the first time, that we would be totally captivated by a God who loves and adores us, our Heavenly Father, who 
is watching us learn how to walk, learn how to become everything that he dreams for our lives. And so, Lord, we just thank you that you didn't come to take all the trouble out of life, but you did promise to say that we could overcome it. And so we leave this place with mission for well-being for ourselves looking upward and to make the world a better place by well-being looking outward. We're going to find a need and meet it. We're going to find a hurt and heal it. And we're going to choose joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to just have some music playing. If you want to just take a moment with the Lord, you can do that. If you have obligations um, in the form of children in the building or you have obligations in the form of a ham at home cooking in the oven, we just ask that you quietly kind of slip your way out. Lord loves you. We love you too. God bless you.
Thank you for joining us for today's service. If you missed any part of this sermon or you want to catch it again, you can do so by going to Apple Podcast, YouTube, or Spotify. And I also encourage you to go to lolag.org or ne-cc.org if you want to stay up to date on everything we have going on. God bless, and we'll see you next week.